Thank you, everybody. I hope you guys are doing well and still have some energy left in you <laughs> to listen for the next half an hour. I, a little bit of background about me. Uh, I work as a senior data scientist at Fitch Ratings. Uh, we are a credit rating and a fintech company. And our previous panel, as they were saying, yes, we are in a business of no. So this talk today is, I will try to not bore any of you. The point is to kind of talk about opportunities that any business domain, not only fintech, but I'll give some examples from fintech that can leverage to kind of you know get started with data science, try and figure out what uh, solutions we can build without like you know uh, wasting a lot of resources or like you know get, having like you know a lot of time to start that build up process because we all know we have to buy get the buy in from the management right, so you have to show some value and you can't just wait forever to showcase that. So the goal of the presentation today is just to talk about some of the NLP trends that's happening. I'm sure you all heard about ChatGPT in the previous uh, example, in the previous panel, and I'm just going to show you some examples. And then talk about this technique of transfer learning in NLP that a lot of the business use cases that we see uh, across industries, uh, also in FinTech, uh, is ve that's very relevant. And I had like a whole a collab notebook for code, but I don't want to get into too much technical, just not to bore you guys, but I can share it out later after the talk. But I do have some screenshots of code just to show the demo of what you can do with open source as is. Uh, not going too deep, just wanted to showcase one aspect of what NLP is. If you look in the, uh, uh, the Venn diagram, one big chunk of it is linguistics. That means a usage of a huge amount of English language data. English I'm saying as a primary, but then you have secondary languages that you want translations from when you're building a translation model. Uh, as well as trying to, you know, uh, doing a POS tags model that also has multiple language uh, insights into it. But this is one of the trickiest area in NLP in, in terms of you have to have subject matter experts who really understand that. And me being a data scientist and not like a language expert, there have been moments where we'll have to go back to the SME and saying that, hey, is this right? Does this make sense? Is this process looking what you expected it to be? And this kind of guardrails is very, very important in uh, uh, in the domain of NLP, where there's like n there are right answers, but sometimes it can get very phased out, and you wouldn't know exactly if you were landing to the right answer or not. So uh, that's why all the governance is in place, right? Okay, this is my favorite chart, and if you see, I keep adding every time I have a presentation uh, to the uh, uh, left of the chart, and the last one that I added is, of course, the OpenAI's GPT, uh, a chart GPT uh, platform. But the point of this chart is to show that in the last maybe, how many, like maybe four, three, four years, the exponential growth of some of these language models that have been released by big tech companies like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, OpenAI, they are they are there for everybody to leverage. And I think this is the best thing that has happened in tech because sometimes when, say, you are a startup or even companies like us, like when we are starting to build a product or uh, uh, trying to solve a problem, not necessarily you have the data uh, in the right place or even the team in the right place. So how much, how much uh, uh, can you, you know, uh, build from scratch? So those times are gone, and I'm so happy for that. Going forward. This is like a very, very good visualization uh, that Google released in one of their recent papers just to showcase the industry adoption and the type of problem that NLP is solving these days. So if you see the growth, the billion parameters is the parameters used to train a pre-trained base model. And on top on the tree, uh, you would see the, the use cases. So starting from question answering, uh, arithmetic code completion. We already saw an example uh, uh, with ChatGPT, right? Like if you're asking them that, hey, I have a bug in the question. Can you help me solve? It is able to find the bug and say that, hey, there's a syntax error or there's like you know missing a parenthesis. So these kind of things are actually getting already implemented. And then there's of course uh, summarization, language understanding, uh, translation uh, for the use cases. We're going to be talking about question answering today uh, at the later part of the talk. But I wanted to understand from you guys how how do you guys feel about nlp do you guys work in that started implementing some of the open source or like you know played around with the open source technologies uh, anybody have any experience on doing that or no okay uh, well, what kind of tools are you using like uh, is it just like calling in from hugging face or pre-trained models 
w would you mind sharing like what kind of use cases have you dealt with before? Yeah, behavior. Customer behavior. Yeah. Absolutely. So basically, intent classification, trying to you know bucketize based on uh, uh, their uh, requirements. That's great. Okay, so I I'll skip over to this example first. Uh, if you see, I was asking. Uh, and it was in their paper as well in the open uh, AI chat GPT that it says that the user was asking, help me write a short note to, the inter uh, to introduce myself to my neighbor. So it like wrote a very nice, hi there, I just moved in. I, I hope all of you can see it. It's kind of small. Sorry about that. And then the next question was, can you make it more formal? So do you see that you are not even, I'm sure all of you have used Alexa, and every time you have to use it, you have to say Alexa and then the full question. But do you see this is like a dialogue? You are not repeating the question anymore. You are now saying, just prompting it that based on your previous answer, can you make it more formal? So it looks like more of a, like how would you talk to a person, like a human uh, 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 way of talking about it. And that is the biggest hurdle that natural language understanding and natural language generation is trying to get through to. And I'm pretty positive about some of these results. There is a lot, lot to fix here if you try some of the other questions, like please look up in Twitter threads, they have like obnoxious kinds of answers that come out, but, but it's going to be there, right? It's the first iteration, you need to train it, you need to have human QA, but that's the point, that you I develop iteratively, and uh, this is like a pretty good answer, right? Like when you say make it fo more formal, it says that, hey, I moved in recently, and it's in a very nice formal way versus the previous one where they were like, hey, I just moved in next door, so uh, very fascinating. So uh, the next couple of slides, I'm just going to talk about where we are applying most of the NLP and some of the use cases so that you get, like, you know, how the takeaway from it should be for you to think that do you have a similar situation in your organization? Is there a way that you can solve for that without trying to build everything from scratch, right? Uh, before that, I, I'm sure you saw the title of my presentation, right? It was pretty big, and I was, like, not really happy about it after I submitted so I was just asking that can you like you know highlight use cases of NLP again asking it to chat GPT and make it look like it's a conference talk title. So if you look, all of these are ways that NLP can be useful in the fintech. It says uncovering financial fraud with NLP colon a case study in fintech. Sounds like a perfect uh, title, right? Conference. I was like, oh, why didn't I ask it before? I would have got a better title. And then uh, personalizing the investment experience with NLP, revolutionizing customer service, like uh, you already mentioned some of the use case here. So very fascinating. So you are kind of trying to build in, uh, so it's giving you the answer, but in a format of a title. You can ask it in any way, and I would encourage all of you to guys, please go and uh, take a peek at it. And then I just had to ask. So I was just asking, can you now explain this like a 10-year-old? So now it says that, it can help companies catch people who try to do bad things with money. Well, makes sense, right? You, you can tell what you're trying to do to your kids or family or your mom uh, who doesn't understand the field. But yeah, very, very uh, uh, significant, uh, I would say, advancement in the way that we understand language. Now, now the, this is the more crucial thing. And some of the areas that I have already worked on uh, in other different industries as well. So my background is also from ad tech and media tech. So that was a very fast moving, different kind of a data, huge flow of uh, real time data that we were observing. But FinTech is a little different, but then we have like similar use cases here. So first would definitely be the customer service where you are doing like virtual assistants, chatbots, trying to like, you know, create a conversational uh, 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 value uh, with your customer without them trying to like, you know, set up and talk to customer agents all the time, which can take time as well as human resources. And then CRM optimization. This is one of the big, big chunk where you see in, in business and in sales and marketing team, you have multiple channels that you talk to your um, clients and would be clients, potential clients, or even ex clients, right? So if you are able to kind of combine that end to end communication channel into one, you can definitely then leverage different kinds of uh, data mining, NLP techniques. To, c to kind of then find patterns that, okay, why did we lose uh, that particular client? Did they have like some other, uh, did my competitor had something else that our company didn't have? So those kind of insights you are able to find much, much easier and quicker than like somebody sitting and trying to find and dig through the data uh, uh, manually. Then there's also credit trading. So uh, 
I'm sure uh, in, in not only in finance and everywhere, like you see the amount of unstructured text based that's coming out from report, different kind of analysis, blogs, and uh, like whatnot. So what do we do with that much of unstructured data? You need to kind of quantify it some somehow, right? And you quantify it, you classify it based on whatever, like maybe your internal taxonomy, you have like a, a way to classify it, like uh, the gentleman mentioned that they're classifying uh, customers' behavior based on uh, their intents, the similar way that how do you classify which what falls under what taxonomy, and that will give you a quantification uh, based on weights. And then, of course, governance. So fraud, risk management, a uh, very crucial area in fintech, and it should be in every, every domain as well. So uh, uh, leveraging this kind of open source technology can get you ramped up pretty quickly, at least to start off, and then say that, hey, you have the value here, and uh, you can invest more time, more data, uh, creating more unique data, versus then saying that, uh, I don't know if this gives value or not, if that makes sense. And then, of course, content generation, so which is like natural language generation, so creating automated report, abstractive summary. Like, imagine a person or a uh, credit rating analyst reading 500, 600 pages of document every day, and then trying to make sense of it. Not, and that's only one, so definitely like multiple, uh, maybe 50, 60 documents, and then try to uh, do an abstractive summary and create a report for that uh, particular entity, which is a very challenging task, as well as like time-consuming task. So how do you kind of create, uh, uh, work with different LLP technologies to kind of build that? So how do you do it? There are multiple, uh, so all the, all the wares that we saw here can be kind of be solved by some of the how technologies, First, machine translation. One quick example is like, say in FinTech you are rating a company who has uh, you know, publication in French, so, and they are not a French-speaking native. So how do you build that uh, uh, technology pipeline so that they are easily be able to like reading at the translated full proofed material versus the, uh, the raw one? Then there's, of course, conversational AI. Again, intent classification, building knowledge tree, question answering based because you are creating, the end goal should be for all NLP projects, creating a knowledge base from where you are able to identify what you want to ask the system and get the answers quickly versus trying to like read you know, thousands of documents yourself. And then natural text generation, that falls under the uh, automated report generation process that we spoke about. Legal document understanding. Document understanding is very, very crucial, at least in the initial phases where we are trying to understand what topic does it belong to? Is there a key theme? Is there, a, and it's not only about legal document, any document. So like even if it's sales document, pitch document, and you try to understand, and even if you want to find out key themes from conversations, that also falls under the document understanding uh, position. And then text-based applications, like if you want to run sentiment analysis, if there's like you know uh, uh, threat detection, any kind of social media analysis that you want to run. Now, before we, I, I wouldn't. Uh, there, there's a lot to talk about transfer learning here, but I just want to give the idea of why we are talking about transfer learning. Now, think about like you are a fintech startup or even like a like a small team uh, uh, like us. You can't just like you know have thousands of people uh, uh, working to get create the data or like you know start building the entire pipeline end to end. So what transfer learning does for NLP is that when you don't have enough resources and we'll go one by one. So you have don't have enough resources. That is, there is a scarcity of labeled data. Uh, creating labeled data is expensive. You need time, expert resources, SMEs who need to validate it, finalize it. But that happens in a slow manner. So how do you ramp up a little quicker? than waiting for that data to happen, right? And then also, if you already have a use case at hand, like say classification, document classification, and you want to maybe, an example, like classify uh, documents, news articles, saying that if it's a sports article or maybe it's a movie article, just an example, like what, what is the meta classification type should be? All that kind of data pre-processed model already exists in the open source market. Like Google had released so many different uh, uh, model that was trained on Wikipedia data, news data, blog data. So they un the, the underlying language, the underlying concept still remains the same. So you can then leverage some of these open source models to get started and then keep fine tuning, retraining based on your specific data. So one big area is that it has to have the same kind of input properties. Like if you are building an LP model, you can't like use a, what do you call it, a computer vision uh, based 
model, right? So it has to have the same input features where it will be able to transfer the knowledge it learned from the first task or the first domain, not domain specific data, but the uh, open source data, and then you apply it for your domain specific data. So just a quick example again, the same example I gave, uh, they are the same domain because we are talking about images here, same kind of format, but then different task. Why is it a different task? Because the labels are different. Like so you say you, you created, uh, uh, ImageNet already has this model available and you can start playing around with it, right? So uh, the output of this will be general object labels, like if it's a tree or a cat or a house, a specific object-based uh, identification. But your target domain, and this is just an example, say that you are, uh, I don't know, like a, maybe Lyft, and <laughs> Lyft wants to understand that uh, they are in urban, urban domain or if they are in a rural area based on the images that it takes from uh, its uh, LIDAR technology. So how do you differentiate? Its, it's starting point is the same, right? The urban would have like maybe uh, big uh, cities and uh, big uh, houses, so it kind of has the same base learnings that it has learned from these images. The only thing that changes is the last layer in a neural network. I wouldn't go too deep in that, but the concept is you have the base images, base weights, and base features that you learned from the public domain open source model, and you finalize or fine tune it on top of it to uh, get to the final stage, uh, which will give you that final task. And the other segment of it is that it's a different domain, but the same task. Different domain in the sense, if you see, uh, I'm sorry if you're not able to see, but it, it is uh, a German document. The, it, both are text, but then one is German, one is English. But then your source tag is that you want to do a POS tagging, which is a, your uh, tagging if uh, the part of speech for each of these individuals. So you need to have like a translation pipeline in between just to make sure that uh, you are uh, at the same page when you're doing the POS tagging. Now. How can you leverage some of the off-the-shelf pre-trained models? And I think uh, I, I have said this enough in all the talks that I've given is that Hugging Face, I think, it has changed the way open source AI community works, implements some of these use cases. They have like, uh, if you have not, please feel free to go out, check out their uh, data sets. They have list of data, list of possible ways of how you can solve, like even for question answering, and then also an uh, uh, entire community of people uh, submitting their own model. So if somebody has exper experimented with something, found good results, they will host it, and you can do some inferences on that as well. So you basically leverage those pre-trained model weights so that the extract, uh, you can extract the features. In the previous example, like I said, the images, uh, images features, you replace the last final layer to create your own classifier. That depends on your what kind of data you have, what have you be able to build, and then you freeze the rest of the model's weight just so that you're not you know, uh, updating any of the previous training models. This is one, pro one way of doing it. And then the other is like, of course, uh, you just do off-the-shelf plus augmentation, which is like you have now been able to you know, create some well-defined targets. You have like your know, new SMEs coming in, helping you build that process a little step by step. So then you kind of retrain without freezing the layers completely, retrain, and then uh, update the last layers to focus on that specific task that you want to uh, solve for. This is just a visual representation of all the text that was here, but I wanted to segment it out just so that it focuses on the key areas that we just discussed. If you see from top, uh, uh, the first step is definitely feature learning, where we have the training images from ImageNet. Uh, the source task is, of course, uh, building the entire deep learning network, convolutional layers, fully connected layers, and if you see the final output, like we discussed, they are very general image-based objects, specific objects. But when you do the transfer learning parameters, now you have a, you did the transfer learning, but you have a knowledge base available with you, right? You already have learned all the weights that you have downloaded here. The only thing that you're doing new is you're updating, sorry, you're updating urban rural image data set and with the new training image data sets, and then that's creating the FC8A, the last green layer that you're creating on the last end and that's able to help you to kind of di differentiate between the uh, classification you did in the first one and in the second one. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll not get into any detail. Just key things to highlight. So we already discussed about that. Why are we doing this? It's giving you an initial like skill of the model, right? Your model is not starting from scratch. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys remember, I think two, three years back when we were building models from scratch using Word2Vec, 
those were like my nightmare days because there were no data. There was like all the, and Word to Vec had like a very uh, issue of out of vocabulary issues. So if there's a new training data or a new word, it's not going to fit into that. So I'm like, how do I make sense of it or how do I like make my model more, uh, you know, better, quicklier? So this is the way. So using, utilizing some of these open source uh, uh, models and then re retraining and relearning on top of that. It gives you a higher learning rate because your model has already learned a lot of it. So you're not starting from scratch. The loss is much lesser and then uh, faster and cheaper to train as well. Uh, just the same, uh, uh, what do you call the examples we saw, you spoke about earlier, but just a visual representation to see that if you're in a customer chat and you're asking a question, and this we do in an uh, answer, question answering uh, process as well, and we'll see an example later. But when you ask a question, how do I reset my question, that needs to be, uh, broken down into an embedding token, right? That's how the model is going to understand that, hey, have I seen this kind of a content before? Is it already in my knowledge base that has, that was trained on a previously pre-trained data? And then if yes, then you kind of have that intent classification coming from either the previously answered data or is it already there in the training knowledge base system? And then you kind of return top three based on, like maybe a, you do a document score, a similarity score, and then return three most similar saved answer that was found in the uh, knowledge domain. This is one of the most, I would say, interesting area for me uh, because I kind of specialize under NLP in information retrieval models. Uh, the, the idea is, like say you have 500,000 pages of a document and you can't just read everything. And just imagine like people who does uh, uh, credit rating, they have to like, read thousands and thousands of documents. So how can you make it easier for them to able to at least identify which areas they need to focus on. They need still need to read the document, but at least you kind of you know find where the questions possible answer paragraph might be and where the exact answer is. Now it's on them to kind of decide if it makes sense for them, then they choose it or no, then they don't choose it. So that becomes like you know a feedback loop for our model to keep uh, updating it in any use case. So here there's a context. The question here was like, when did Beyonce start becoming popular? I think she's always popular, right? But then, um, but then you, you can see the highlighted in yellow text starts coming up as like sentence having the right answer, and then the exact answer was kind of uh, uh, found from in the late 90s uh, from the sentence when it says that rose to fame. So do you see how the question when it was asked become started becoming popular to rose to fame? It basically means the same thing, right? Like similar uh, contextual meaning, different words, but it's still able to identify why. Because when we train the model with such a huge amount of training data set, it kind of, that's the same concept of embed vector, embedding vector space. So if you have one particular keyword, you also have associated keywords that gets mapped to the same space, saying that they mean the same thing based on the representation of the text that they were found in. And they can be uh, applied to newer text as well, even though they have not seen it. But uh, that, that's the beauty of large language models, right? I'm going to talk about this, but let's look at the Q&A. So this is just a sample example. You uh, can easily download this model from Hugging Face. Just download their transformers, uh, install, and the, the PyTorch model. But the goal here is to show that if you have a distal BERT model, distal BERT is like a, sorry, a smaller version of BERT. Uh, it is faster. Uh, it uses less parameters, but it still gives you enough accuracy to get started. If you have, like, you don't have GPU resources or you want to put it into production quickly just to check that how it's working uh, in terms of latency uh, uh, while you're serving the model in real time. So you, we are basically downloading a tokenizer here, uh, uh, calling the model uh, from the pre-trained, the distal but base uncased uh, model. And then here I'm giving it just the context. So if you see, th there is, of course, a code in between to translate this question or this context to give you the answer. But there has been no training done. So I'm not retraining this model that I'm downloading from off the shelf uh, Hugging Face library. I'm just giving it a context. And this is like out of, a, I think, Apple's, uh, li uh, what do you call it, like annual report? Sorry, I forgot what that annual report was that I copied it from. It was l just talking about how much return on average investment from their assets they have got, how much their ROI improved compared to last year or last quarter, et cetera. So just a, a paragraph format from there. And without any training, I was just asking the question, so what did Apple achieve? And uh, it was able to identify, here is the answer layer, where it says that 
Oh, I think the answer, oh yeah, here, the complete answer you can read through here. Uh, return on average invested assets uh, of 46.31, which you find in the first line in fourth quarter. So this kind of shows that you don't, uh, I have to add though, that this doesn't mean that you can utilize this for your use cases, which is very specific to your company, or even like, you know, very niche use cases that's maybe you won't only talk about, I don't know, sustainable documents. So maybe it might not work out as well. So you definitely have to retrain it on top of that for your business use case purposes. But it gives you a good start, right? You're already able to identify ways uh, to kind of get some of the answers out of it. And then, so I was just asking another question, like why did Apple ROI improve? And the answer it found me, I can't see it even from the here. I don't know how you guys are seeing. So, <laughs> so the uh, how did it improve? So the answer then becomes net income growth, which you can find in the second line, right? Like it says, ROI improved compared to previous quarter due to net income growth. So, so, so this is just a way to kind of highlight that. And there are some other examples you can uh, take a look later. But then uh, just to showcase that this doesn't mean that we have solved all the problems without, uh, without like you know doing any training by ourselves, just using off-the-shelf models. This is just to get you started to the foot of the door. Tell your business uh, leaders that, hey, look, this is possible. This is a solution that we can start building on without like you know saying that just wait for six months and I will build an amazing model. And then they'll be like, I can't wait for six months. So this is just a way to start those discussions, get those buy-ins, get those confidence in, and say that this is possible doing uh, doing open source models, and then stating those requirements of what you need exactly to retrain them to make your uh, particular product that you're building uh, more accurate. But uh, yeah, that's all I had. I went through that very quickly. I wanted to keep some time uh, for questions. If you guys have any, uh, I know quite a few of you work in the finance as well. So would love to, uh, or from any industry, like doesn't matter NLP is like, it's there everywhere. It's omnipresent, <laughs> I to say. But yeah, thank you for listening in and let me know if you have any questions.